Good morning, my friends. I'm so glad you could be with me today and unfolding the word. As you know, if you've been with me, we're in the midst of a study of the book of Daniel, and lately we've been focused on Daniel chapter 7, really the first of the series of prophetic chapters running from Daniel chapter 7 through Daniel chapter 12. Today I want to pick up our reading in chapter 7, in verse 7, and then jump ahead to verse 24. Here is verse 7. After this, I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, terrifying and dreadful and exceedingly strong. It had great iron teeth that devoured and broke in pieces and stamped what was left with its feet. And it was different from all the beasts that were before it. And then it had ten horns, and I considered the horns. Then jumping ahead to uh, verse 24, or 23, As for the fourth beast, there shall be a fourth kingdom on earth, which shall be different from all the kingdoms. And it shall devour the whole earth and trample it and break it to pieces. As for the ten horns, out of this kingdom ten kings shall arise, and then another shall arise after them. And he shall be different than the former ones, and shall put down three kings. <laughs> We're talking about this prophetic dream that God had sent to Daniel uh, late in his life, while the Babylonian Empire was still in control, uh, but nonetheless in its final stages. It was a dream that paralleled, in some respects, the dream that was sent to Nebuchadnezzar in chapter 2. In that case, it was the dream of a huge statue or image, and it talked about the flow of Gentile kingdoms, kingdoms that would impact upon the Jews up until the return of the Messiah, Christ, and the implementation of his kingdom, which goes and spreads throughout all of the world. In this case, it's not a statue, but a, but a picture of different beasts emerging from the sea, the sea being the turbulent sea of time, the beast being kingdoms that in God's purpose and plan emerge. We talked about the first, and, and the overall dream, I said, is best to think of in terms of a number of scenes from an act or scenes from a movie. Uh, we have looked at scene one, which was the kingdom of the flying lion, which referred to Babylon. We've looked at scene two, the kingdom of the bear beast, which was Medo-Persian Empire. We looked at Kingdom scene number three, which was the kingdom of the flying leopard, the Greek empire under Alexander the Great and those who succeeded him in leadership. The fourth kingdom, that terrifying beast kingdom, was scene four. It was the picture of Rome, the Iron Kingdom of chapter two. Now today, picking up on that, we want to talk about the kingdom of the ten horns that period paralleling the mixed iron and clay that is in chapter 2. As I said the last time we were together, the Roman Empire, different from the previous empires, never completely disappeared. Oh, it lost control of various regions, but it never ceased in that sense. It's, I guess you could say it's been hibernating, not dead, not active, not, uh, not back in control, but hibernating, awaiting a specific time. And in God's timetable, and chapter 7 helps us to see it ever more clearly, in God's timetable, the beast, this fourth beast, will reemerge as a power. The key is that this reemerging power, this scene number five, the ten-horned beast, will take a different form than seen for Rome. The beast will emerge again, the beast that is really Rome in hibernation, so to speak. It will emerge as a ten-nation confederacy. The idea of horns, prophetically, refers generally to either a ruler or a kingdom. In this case, I think it probably refers to this both at the same time. But at any rate, he tells us that at a certain point, there will be this reemergence of the seeds of the Roman Empire. These ten rulers of these ten kingdoms will unite together in a confederation. This confederation, this ten nation confederation, will be united certainly politically. 
It will certainly be united militarily, and therefore, by implication, united economically and socially as well. Ten kingdoms that now function as a single kingdom. The region that this re-emerging ten-horned, ten-nation confederation of Rome will take, the region it will situate itself, is somewhere within the region once controlled by the fourth beast before it went into hibernation. And you say, well, what region is that? Well, when you study history and you recognize the extent of the Roman Empire and its greatest periods of influence, you realize that much of Western Europe, even up into the British Isles, much of Central Europe, all of North Africa, much of the Middle East, up into Turkey and that region, all of that region was under the control at one point in time of the fourth beast, Rome. Therefore, the, the logical conclusion of what all is meant by this particular prophecy, and we can't know all that's meant, but we can know this much, that those ten nations that unite together in confederation at some point will come out of that region. Not all of that region will be those ten nations, probably, but the ten nations will be within that broad region. This ten-nation confederacy will be very powerful and ultimately world-influencing and then world-dominating. As I've already said, it parallels the ten toes mixed iron and clay of the chapter 2 dream that was sent to Nebuchadnezzar. Here's the point. God is giving us this insight into this fifth scene to tell us, listen, the geopolitical change that is marked by this reemergence of what came out of the former Roman Empire in a ten-nation confederation, this reemergence will be a clear sign of the next step in God's unfolding plan of history. When we see it, we know we're moving forward and moving toward the culmination of history that God has in mind. Now here's the point also. We know because of the trustworthiness of God's word that this ten-nation confederacy will emerge just like all of the other beasts emerged just as God said they would, because remember, he's the Lord of history. He is control of it. We know it will emerge. What we don't know is the exact time it will reemerge, because he doesn't tell us in this dream how long this period of hibernation, I'll call it, of the Roman Empire will go on. But at some point, we know it will end, and the reemergence in this ten nation form will occur. We could speculate on how long that would be and when it's likely to end, and I don't think speculation is very useful to us, although I will say I think we're pretty close in the timetable of history to that. But that's only my take on it. Uh, I stand wet, ready to be corrected by God when I appear before Him. But I do think other things would lead me to believe we're close to that re-emergence sort of period in the timetable of history. Well, getting back, and I want to end with this, the fourth beast, Rome, actually goes through three stages prophetically as Daniel unfolds them for us. The first stage, which was seen for, was that classic Roman Empire, that empire that controlled the Holy Land at the time of Christ's first coming, the empire responsible for his crucifixion, the empire responsible for the destruction ultimately of Jerusalem and the dispersion of the Jewish people. Scene four is obviously and clearly, biblically, referring to the Roman Empire. Scene five that we're looking at today is referring to a second stage of this Roman Empire, which is this ten-nation confederacy that will reemerge. The next scene, which we'll get into tomorrow and talk more about, is the third stage of this reemergent Roman Empire. 
And that is the stage of what Daniel 7 describes as the little horn stage. A period of time where one individual moves to the forefront and takes over the control of this reemergent ten nation confederacy representing the re the renewal of Rome. The emergence of the ten nation confederacy is the necessary prerequisite for the emergence of this little horn. And I'll say today and develop it more for you tomorrow, clearly the little horn being referred to here is the antichrist of much of the rest of prophecy. Well, join me tomorrow as we turn to scene six in this dream in Daniel chapter seven, the era of the little horn. God bless.